All right, so yes, spiritual revival number seven. We are finishing up the book this evening. Now, the book, of course, that we've been studying is Steps to Personal Revival. And um, we have that book here in front of us for anyone else who is not here. They can find the book to be downloaded at uh, discipleshipcourse.org. Discipleshipcourse.org. Steps to Personal Revival. Really been a blessing to, to me, and I know this group as we've studied. Um, it's really a, a study on the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we've studied several items. So, we've studied the process of revival. Last week we got into the promise of revival, right? The promise is very clear in Scripture. God wants to give us the Holy Spirit, and when the Holy Spirit does come... or when, it, when the Holy Spirit is poured out full strength in the latter rain, it's going to do wonderful and amazing things in the church. So the process, the promise, and tonight we're going to look at the pattern. There's a pattern as all things through Scripture, right? We've got that golden thread from Genesis to Revelation and beyond, right? And even in the pattern of the pouring out of the Spirit, as we'll see through the old and new, there's a lesson for us in, in the last days here. So... Let's start in Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 9. That's back at the beginning, of course, of Scripture. Third book of the Bible, Leviticus chapter 9. Now in Exodus, of course, Moses is given the pattern of the tabernacle, the wilderness tabernacle. And then the rest of Exodus and into Leviticus is the story of them, you know, um, shaping it and, and, and making it and, and the whole bit. And then in chapter 9, we see the dedication of the sanctuary. Okay? So Leviticus chapter 9. And let's catch what happens during this dedication. Leviticus chapter 9. Who would like to read verse 23 and 24? Thank you, Miss Norma. Leviticus 9, 23 and 24. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. Alright, so we have a pattern here that we're going to catch, and it's going to take place several times now in, in Scripture. We've got fire falling from heaven. We've got the glory of the Lord seen. And then the third part of the pattern is that the people praise God. Okay? I should state in word and action. These are important. They go together. We've talked about that already in this series. How we worship the Lord in Spirit and truth, right? Word and action, belief and consequence, things that we do, effects. Okay? So here's this pattern. When the temple is dedicated, or I'm sorry, the tabernacle is dedicated, we see fire fall from heaven, the people see the glory of the Lord, and there's an effect when you have your eyes turned on the glory of the Lord, people praise God in both word and action, right? All right, let's see if that pattern takes place at the next dedication. When would that be? Anyone know? What would be the next tabernacle or sanctuary? Solomon's temple. Right. So let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 1. Second Chronicles. I think I've mentioned before, but I'll say it in case anyone hasn't heard this. You know, when I was uh, a while ago, and I was reading through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I knew that First and Second Chronicles basically repeat what 
Samuel and King say. And so as I was getting closer to it, I was kind of dreading, okay, uh, we got to read through Chronicles. That's coming up because it's going to repeat everything I just read, right? And then I got into Chronicles and realized, wow, there's a lot of new information that Samuel and the kings don't go over. I mean, the same stories, but it's like Chronicles adds to it, right? It fluffs up the story. So I really appreciate the Chronicles being in here. All right, 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Do we have a volunteer to read 1 through 3? Verses 1 through 3. Fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord, because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Amen. You know, that thought, by the way, and this I've also mentioned before, for his mercy endures forever. What's the longest chapter in Scripture? Anyone know? What's the longest chapter in Scripture? Psalms 119. What's the shortest chapter in Scripture? Psalms 117. And what's the very middle of the Bible? <laughs> Psalms 117. 18, right? And so what's the theme of Psalms 118? His mercy endures forever because that's at the very heart of all of the scripture from Genesis to Revelation, right? His mercy endures forever. By the way, that also proves in an inspired way that there should be two testaments because Psalms 118 is not the middle of the Old Testament. It's only the middle of the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation. Okay, and so when you've got the shortest chapter, longest chapter, and then this really key chapter in the middle, kind of shows you something. There should be two, two, two covenant or two testaments that work together, right? All right, but that was a side note. Did we see a pattern here, or did we see what did we see this pattern in this story? So they dedicated Solomon's temple. Did we see fire fall from heaven? Yes. Did we see the glory of the Lord fill the temple? Yes. Did the people praise God in word and action? What was their action? Falling down on their faces. What was their word? For the mercy of the Lord endures forever. Right? Okay, so we've got this pattern. Now, how about another one? Well, this isn't exactly a moment where a building is dedicated, but there's a new sanctuary in the New Testament. A new kind of sanctuary, right? Where does, the, where does the Spirit of the Lord dwell now? Within us. So we're now the sanctuary, right? And so were we, the church, not just we as Adventists or we as in me, but we as in the church, were we dedicated before God? Yes, so that's called the day of Pentecost. Okay? Look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. We covered this in detail last week. If you missed number 6, we saw that this was a fulfillment of the feasts, one of the feasts, right? The Feast of Weeks. That came 50 days after um, the previous feast, the Feast of, um, <laughs> uh, I totally drew a blank. There was Passover, then there was, uh, who's got their notes? <laughs> uh, not Unleavened Bread, the other one. Um, there was the, the one right there. Anyway. The first group. First fruits, thank you, right? That, that waving of the first fruits, right? That was the ascension of Jesus, right? And then 50 days later was the day of Pentecost, right? Good, thank you. See? See how, how uh, <laughs> off I am when I don't have notes in front of me, right? I'm getting old. All right, Acts chapter 2. This is the dedication of the New Testament sanctuary. Not the, you know, there's the heavenly sanctuary. That's also a very strong theme in the New Testament. But on earth, there's an earthly sanctuary still. That's us. Okay? Now let's notice if we see this pattern. Who would like to read uh, verses 1 through 3 again? Chapter 2, Acts 2, verses 1 through 3. Anybody? Thank you, Ray. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. 
heaven as a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and one sat upon each of them. Okay. Did we see fire fall from heaven? The tongues of fire, right? Did we see the glory of the Lord? Uh-oh, Pastor Phil, we didn't have the word glory in verses 1 through 3. What does the glory of the Lord do in the first two stories? It fills the house, right? Does something fill the house in this story? The sound of the rushing wind. That's the entrance of the glory of God, right? Why don't they see it? Because where is it? It's in, the, it's in us, right? It's in, our, it's in our spirit, right? Don't say it, but they hear the entrance of it because the rushing wind fills the house. Do people praise God in word and action in the story? Obviously, and then thousands are baptized, right? We've got the, the disciples uh, speaking in, 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 in other languages, right, where everyone understands what's going on. And then we've got Peter's sermon, this phenomenal sermon, right, about uh, the risen Lord. So we've got this pattern still. Okay, now, we've studied this already, so we won't spend a lot of time reviewing this, but this is called the early rain. And when there's an early rain, what does that tell us comes later? The latter rain, right? Okay, we're getting this monsoon season right now, and I've got three trees out front of our house, out in the, the school side of our house. And I promise you, there was a tree that was shorter than me just days ago. <laughs> And now, after all this rain we've been getting, now I look up at it. I mean, it shot up, right? It's huge. And I literally, it, I think, I don't know, it feels like it happened literally in one day. Because I, I walked out of the house and I went, what? And I walked down the steps. I was like, whoa, it's taller than me, right? Just out of nowhere. Okay, yeah. Okay, so let's notice this latter rain experience as it's prophesied. It's prophesied in several places, like in the book of Joel. But let's look at Revelations. The Revelation prophecy of the latter rain experience. Revelation 18. Now, before we get there, this fire that comes from heaven, what really is this fire? It, it's, it's, it's the Holy Spirit, right? And it's, it's a symbol that God is, is falling on earth, right? That God is coming down. Because we believe that the Holy Spirit is God, right? He is God. He is, he, is, he is one of the Godhead members, okay? So let's notice Revelation 18. And who would like to verse, read verse 1? Then we'll read more in a bit, but notice verse 1 first. Anybody want to read verse 1? Thank you again, Miss Norma. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was light with his glory. Yeah, illuminated with his glory is, is the New King James, right? Or lightened, right? So it's this bright, it's this fire, it's this light, right? And it's coming down from where? Heaven. From heaven. And the earth is filled with what? The glory. So do we have the first, start, the first parts of the pattern? We have the fire or the presence of God, right? Falling down from heaven. We've got the earth now being, isn't that a great promise? The church is filled with the glory of the Lord, but soon the earth is going to be filled with it. Now, people will still accept it or, or not accept it, right, in the last days, but the message will go out to the whole world. Everyone will know. Right now, there are people who have prejudice against the gospel and against the Bible. They have biases against it. Their ears are plugged to it. They don't want to hear it. And then there's people who are just simply ignorant. They've never, it's never been presented to them, right? But before Jesus returns, the earth will be filled with the glory. Everyone will have a chance to know of God's love for them and the sacrifice and the love of Jesus Christ, right? That's the promise. The earth will be filled with it. Okay, now is there a message that goes with that? Because remember the third part of the pattern is people praise God in word and action. Well, let's notice verse 4. Anybody want to read verse 4? Same chapter, Revelation 18 and verse 4. Thank you, Mary Lou. And I heard another voice from heaven sing, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins. Unless you share, unless you receive a perfect. Good. 
Is there going to be a proclamation of the gospel in the last days? Come out of her, Babylon, right? The, the harlot woman, the system of revelation. Come out of her. What does Jesus call them? My people. Jesus has people in the false Babylon system. He doesn't say, you knuckleheads, you, you, know, you lazy procrastinators. You, he says, come out of her, my people. He accepts them for what they know. They maybe don't know the fullness of the gospel, don't know the word, right? And, and Babylon is the confusion of this world, which means there are people in every place, every denomination, maybe even other religions, who the, all they know is Buddhism, or all they know is Hindi, but, but somewhere in there they cling to this truth that God is love, right? And Jesus will say to them, come out of her, those false religions, oh, that false system, my people. Why? Because I don't want you to share in her sins. So when you don't share in the sins, that's the gospel of salvation, right? It's the gospel of salvation that's going to be preached to the world. Don't follow those sins. Get away. There's confession. There's repentance. There's, there's forgiveness. There's salvation by grace through faith, right? That's the message that will, be, that will be going out. We will praise God in word and action. Well, that for, the church to not, for the church to fully and completely preach the message to come out of sin, the church will have been called out of sin. And the church won't be the church that we see today that's, that, that does all kinds of crazy things or bad things. I know there's lots of good people in the church, right? But there's also wolves in sheep's clothing. They will be weeded out and the church will be full in the fullness of the gospel. That's good news. Really good news. So, we have these four moments where the, the, the sanctuary, either a building or the church, is dedicated and revival takes place, reformation takes place, and in each of those four stories we see this pattern, this pattern, okay? Now notice Revelation 13 for a moment, because I believe, and I know we believe, that we have an enemy. And the enemy is the reason why we have excuses why we don't have revival and reformation in the church today, right? And why things are so slow and why things are so stressful and why the church that has so much infighting and trouble and drama, etc. is because we have an enemy, right? He doesn't want these things to happen and so he tries to slow it. And he works by several ways, destruction, delay, and one we're going to notice here, deception. Right? Okay, Revelation 13. So we have these beasts who will unite the world under this one world government in the last days. And notice one of the things they do. Revelation 13, who would like to read verse 13? Again. Thank you. He performs great signs so that he would even make fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. One of the deceptions will be this false revival. Because this isn't really about fire falling from heaven or about real legitimate... Uh, this is about the presence of God, right? Of Christ uh, working in the church. And this fire will fall. This, this false revival will take place. And notice, I'll read verse 14. What, what is the consequence of it? And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. This false fire will cause a false revival, and we will see it as a false revival because who is glorified in it? Is it Christ? No, it's Antichrist, right? And what does Antichrist mean? It means a substitute Christ. It doesn't mean against Christ. It means in place of Christ, right? This in place of Christ figure will stand at the top of the world government and this false revival. So, in the last days, there will be two revivals. And everyone will claim to be part of the right, correct revival. Boy, that's just so typical of Satan, isn't it? To always make things so confusing. And of course, Babylon means confusion, right? 
He does everything he can to make things so confusing. And so if the false revival will be taking place and the false revival will be seen with miracles and wonders and the whole world will go, wow, we should build this image to this. How important is it for the, for the church then to get this going and to get this done and to be brighter and louder when we proclaim the gospel of God? Many will be deceived when we see yeah, many will be deceived. And I think that's what weeds out the, the wolves in sheep's clothing because they're going to go following after that, right? And then the church, which is made up of his people, right, who have come together and unified in truth, they're going to be this small remnant group. But they're going to be loud because how much of the world is illuminated with his glory? The whole world right? So we're going to get this right. That's the promise. Again, we're going to get this right. We're going to do it. But it's important that we do it. Yeah. We've got to do it, right? Because soon this false revival will come and we have to take a stand against it. That's why it's so important to know the scriptures. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very true. Okay, now, if you're good students of the Bible, You've caught that we skipped something. And I'm just teasing about the if you're a good student of the Bible. Did you notice we skipped the temple? It wasn't on <laughs> So we've got, the, we've got the New Testament one. We've got Moses's. We've got Solomon's. There's no need of a revival in the heavenly sanctuary, right? Because heavenly sanctuary is clear and clean. We skipped the temple that Jesus walked in, right? Hezekiah's temple, right? Now, so what about that one? Why didn't we follow? Does that follow the pattern? Well, let's notice Haggai. Can you find the small book of Haggai? It's in the Minor Prophets, near the end of the Old Testament. If you can get there before me, you get a cookie. Oh, I'm already there. <laughs> Haggai chapter 2. Now, I want to be clear that when this temple was dedicated... Oh, wait a moment. Let's get all there. Haggai chapter 2. Okay, so when this temple... This is the temple they built after the captivity. So they go into Babylon, right? And then there's all these calls by the Persians. Go home and build your temple. Go home and rebuild your city. Go home. Finally they do. And this is the work of Ezra and Nehemiah. Finally they get it built. This is that temple. And was it as beautiful as Solomon's temple? Didn't have as much gold. It wasn't as big. It wasn't beautiful. And there were people alive who were young in the days of Solomon's temple. And now we're older after the captivity. And what did they do? Anyone know? They cried when they saw this new temple. Oh, what a terrible and horrible temple this is compared to Solomon's. Now, this temple did not get, well, when it was dedicated, fire did not fall from heaven. The glory of the Lord did not fill this temple. And did people praise God in word and action? What did we just say? They cried over it. They lamented it, right? Why didn't God follow the pattern this one time? Right in the middle, too. There's two, and then there's two, and there's one right in the middle, right? Why? All right, let's notice what Haggai says. The prophet, uh, chapter 2, anybody want to read verses 6 through 9? Thank you, Miss Norma. 6 through 9. Saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heaven and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill the house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of a former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Huh. This one at its dedication did not get a fire fall from heaven moment or a glory of the Lord filling its house moment. 
and the people did not praise in word and action. They cried. Why? Instead, they got a prophecy that something greater than that would take place in the future. Better than this. And it calls it, or him, the desire of all nations. Anyone who's ever read Ellen White's book, The Desire of Ages, she got that title from this phrase right here. Rather than desire of all nations, the desire of all ages, all time, from the beginning to the end. The desire of all nations would come. And, it said, and, and the Lord says, the glory will fill the temple, and the glory will be greater in this one than that one, than Solomon's. What or who is the desire of all nations? Jesus Christ. And Jesus came, where did he come from? From heaven. Did he fill that temple when he walked in it? What did he do in that temple? Do you remember? Flipped over tables and kicked out the, 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 the people selling salvation, right? And he taught and loved and preached and all kinds of things. And he filled that temple with the glory directly from the mouth of God. Not through a prophet, but directly from the mouth of God. That's why it's greater, right, than the last. And did people praise God in word and action? Absolutely. Absolutely. Jesus fulfilled all of that, the pattern of this, Jesus fulfilled in his life in His work, in His love by coming down from heaven. He came down from heaven. He filled the temple with the glory of God. He praised God in both word and action. Now, did you catch that pattern? Sorry, I know some of you might not like math, but here's some math. You've got two buildings and then two stages, the early and latter reign in the church, the New Testament sanctuary, and then you've got one in the middle. And who's that one? This is a building. This is the church. Who's the one that bridges it all together? You've got Jesus. The desire of all nations. He bridges the Old and the New. The Old Testament and the New Testament. The promises and the prophecies of the Old Tabernacle and the Old Sanctuary and the gifts of the Spirit and the New. He bridges it all. He confirms it all. Good word. Very good word. Right? He is the connection. He's our example also, right? We're not to cast out the Old Testament and go, oh, no, I'm sorry. I've had people, not here in town, but in my life, I've had people say, oh, no, you can't read that verse to me. That's from the Old Testament. I only take verses from the New Testament. Or I'm a New Testament believer. Well, the New Testament's fulfilling the Old, but it has to be connected. They work together, right? By the way, we have two great books of apocalyptic literature. What are the two books? We have, well, we know the last one because it's the great one. When we say apocalyptic, we know Revelation. And what's the first one? The book of Daniel. Where's Revelation? It's in the new. Where's Daniel? In the Old Testament, right? They work together. They bridge together, right? The old and the new are bridged together. Now, let's catch something here before we close. Look at Exodus 25. This was at the command now to build a sanctuary. This is God's command to Moses to build the first tabernacle. Exodus chapter 25. I have a uh, family member, native family member, he's related to Sharon, who was recently ranting and raving on, on social media about Jesus and Christianity and was quite racist about Europeans and white people and etc. And, um, and, and, you know, I, I, there was no way he'd hear it from me. I tried, but I, I kept thinking of this, that Jesus is the desire of all nations, right? That's why we can say, or the Bible can declare that in the last days, he'll say, come out of her, my people. Because all the other religions are full of error, but each of them have some truth in them, right? They all have little pieces of truth, right? 
and those who love the truth. He considers, my, he's the desire of all nations, everywhere around the world, right? Everybody. Okay, chapter 25, verse 8 and 9. Who would like to read the Lord's command to Moses? Thank you very much, Ray. And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show you, that is, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the furnishings, just so you may, just so you shall make it. Okay. By the way, we even have the word pattern, so we know this is a pattern, right? It's clear. All right. Build me a sanctuary. Anyone remember what the word sanctuary means? It means a dwelling place. Okay. After a pattern, verse 9 says there's a pattern that God showed Moses. And why does he want a sanctuary built for him? What's the purpose? So that I may dwell with you, right? Isn't that amazing? That the God of the universe wants to dwell with us? That's, that's the essence of the gospel, right? Wow, that's love. I may dwell with you. Okay, now, that's this one, right? That's the buildings. That's the purpose. That's the command. Build me a sanctuary. And I'm going to tell you the pattern. And boy, was there a pattern. Whew. Every little detail was told by God. Everything. Color schemes and engravings and writings and you name it. Everything inside and outside was so very detailed and down to the law. Right? Wow. Then he gave them the talents. And then he gave him the talents to do it. Beautiful thought. And the whole purpose is because he wants to dwell with us, right? God wants to dwell with us, and he wants to clean the house when he dwells with us, right? He wants to fix things up, right? Okay. Now, so that's the old one. Now we have a new one. That's us. Does he follow this pattern? Let's notice. Yeah, he wants to clean us up, right? Now notice when Jesus is ready to ascend, he speaks to his disciples in Matthew chapter 28. And these are his last words according to Matthew, or at least the last words in the book of Matthew. And I want you to catch what Jesus says in the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, first book of the New Testament, the first gospel. And we're going to close here. It's time for us to close. Matthew chapter 28, and who would like to read 18 through 20? Okay, fine, I'll read it. <laughs> All right, verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, this is the 11 disciples, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, I realize the church has the authority, but who do we have our authority in? In Jesus, right? Not in Peter, right? Peter and the church were given authority, but our authority is in Christ, not in ourselves, right? Christ has authority in heaven and earth. All right, that was a side note. Verse 19, go. By the way, who? lots of side notes here. The word go, is that a request or a command? Command, right? Build me a sanctuary. Was that a request or a command? That's a command, right? Now, we have the ability to obey or disobey. These are commands. Build me a sanctuary. Go, right? All right, verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of who? Oh. Ooh, all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, is that build me a sanctuary? Because who's the sanctuary? The church is, right? So this is his command, build me a sanctuary. What's the next part? Follow the pattern. 
Follow the pattern, okay? So we should see that command in verse 20. Here's verse 20. Teaching them to what? Observe all things that I have commanded you. Do we see a pattern? Is, is there a command to follow a pattern? Teaching them to observe all things that I have taught you. So he has taught them the pattern. He has taught the disciples, here's the pattern. Now go teach it to them when you baptize them. And then the next promise should be that he's going to be with us, right? Why build the sanctuary? That I may dwell with you according to Exodus. Okay, let's finish the verse. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Right? There's a pattern in this. Build me a sanctuary. Both of them have this command. Build me a sanctuary after the pattern that I may dwell with you. Do we want the latter rain to come? We want the final full... I, the Holy Spirit is here. But we want the fullness of the Spirit to come. The fullness of the latter rain to come. What's he waiting for? He's waiting for us to follow the pattern. Do we want revival? We want revival. We've noticed the process, we've noticed the promise, and now we've noticed the pattern. And the pattern will com be completed once we follow the pattern. Who's the pattern? Who's the example? Who's the bridge? Who's the connection? The desire of all nations, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time we had this evening with you and for opening your word. Lord, I know that we're here because we want to follow that pattern. We, we want to know more about you. We want to follow you, Lord, and we love you because you love us. So, Lord, bless us this evening with the Spirit. Help us, Lord, follow this process of revival. Help us claim the promises and help us obey the pattern. In Jesus' precious name, amen.